Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith as we walk through the foundational beliefs of Christianity and Lutheranism as laid out within uh, the Book of Concord here, the Catechism, both large and small, the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, those four documents really forming how we walk through um, this discussion in the coming weeks. And as we do that, last week we dealt with original sin. That's the second article of the Augsburg Confession. The third article, moving forward then, is talking about Jesus Christ. Who was Jesus Christ? What did he do? Why did he have to be here? All of those good things. Um, but within the Augsburg Confession, because the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans believed essentially the same thing about Jesus and his nature, it's actually very, very short in the Augsburg Confession. Um, they don't spend a whole lot of time talking about Jesus. They say he is the Word. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is God incarnate. Um, but they kind of leave it at that. They don't dive too deeply into it. So I'd like to take a look this morning anyway at the Apostles' Creed, the second article of the Apostles' Creed, um, as found within the large and small catechism, as that really outlines kind of our faith on who Jesus was very briefly, on what he did, and his identity and his character. So as we dive into that, um, the first opening line, I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ um, is a title. Jesus was his name. Christ is a title that is actually a translation from the Hebrew for Messiah. That means anointed one. Now, someone who was anointed um, in Old Testament times and even up through the time of Jesus and beyond is someone who's set aside for a purpose, someone who's been called into a position, uh, someone who's been given a special designation or a title, something of that nature. Usually kings were anointed as they took on that kingship, um, different ways of setting someone aside. And so as we say Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the anointed one, we acknowledge right away, even within his name, that he has come for a purpose, that he's been set aside by God for a reason to accomplish a great work on our behalf. And that's what we dive into as we get into the rest of the Apostles' Creed. So we believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, God's only son. What this means is that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's not a created being as we are. He's not a creature Rather, he is part of the Trinity. He is the second person of God. And as we talked about with God in um, the opening article, in the first session there, we believe in God as a Trinity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is the second part of that Trinity, the second person of that Trinity. I think I spoke about it that week, but we see it um, within Scripture all over the place, right from Genesis. As we see God creating, we see the Father there, before creation, we see the Spirit kind of hovering over the formless void. And someone asked me, where do we see Jesus in creation? And the answer to that is, well, what, how did God create? How did he make things come into existence? He spoke. The Word of God is Jesus Christ. That's what we believe as Christians, and that's what we believe as Lutherans. And John, in his Gospel, picks up on this very explicitly. It says, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning echoes the very first words of the Hebrew scriptures, the very first words of Genesis, in the beginning. Uh, Genesis says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John says, in the beginning was the Word. So there's this other person that's present. There's God, there's the Word, and the Spirit, as we see within Genesis, that's there as well. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, there, present at the same time, and indeed the Word was God saying they are the same substance, they are the same. Uh, he was with God in the beginning. And then John goes on to say that everything that was created was created through this word, and that after creation, when the time was right, the word actually took on flesh and dwelt among us. And what John says is that the rest of his gospel, the rest of his book there, is what this word in the flesh did, what Jesus did on our behalf. That's a very, very brief understanding of what it means that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, that he is God in the flesh. Uh, if you have questions on that, please do email me, send something in to YouTube, however that might be. There's a lot of material there. This is just kind of a basic overview. We're going to be diving a lot more into the character, um, the work of Jesus in the coming weeks. We're going to spend a few weeks on Jesus and his purpose. Um, but that's a very, very basic overview. Uh, he has been set aside for a purpose, for our salvation, that he is God's son. He's not created, um, but he is part of that trinity, and so he is fully divine. We see this backed up within scripture, too, as we hear the word of God speaking over Jesus. 
um, at least twice within the Gospels. As we see at his baptism, the Trinity is present there as well. Um, we see God the Father speaking over the Son as the Spirit descends. And the words that God says are, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. We also see that at the Transfiguration as Jesus is up on the mountain uh, with the disciples as Moses and Elijah appear there. The word of God again, the voice of God speaks and says, this is my son. And so God in two distinct places at least claims Jesus not just as a creature, but rather as his son, as a second person of that trinity. Um, so within that we see a little bit of the discomfort and saying, well, okay, if he is God, how is he still a man? God can't be on earth in the form of a man. We can't see God. We can't see his glory because we're sinful creatures. Um, we can't abide God's glory. We'd be put to death right away. And yet we say that God is here on earth with, with us, walking among us, showing us his glory. And the way that we talk about this is the two natures of Christ. And again, I'm not going to go way too deep into this today. Um, we'll spend a little more time on this as we get to Arius in the coming weeks and the, the, um, the uh, debates and councils that were going on over Arianism. Basically, what we believe is that Jesus has two natures. He has his divine nature and he has his human nature. And how these two come together in the person of Jesus Christ is crucial for our belief of Jesus and what he did. Now, Arius said there were some, there were some parts of him that were not fully divine. Jesus was not 100% divine. There were others that said Jesus was not 100% human. He was only divine and kind of looked human. We believe as, as Christians, as Lutherans, that Jesus was both 100% human and 100% divine. So this is a really good place to talk about something um, that we joke about a little bit around uh, the pastoral staff and seminary and things of that nature, but uh, what we would call a Lutheran tension. Basically, this means that when Scripture is silent on something, when Scripture doesn't explain something fully, we have to take it on faith. We see that Jesus is fully human. He does the things humans do. He has to eat. He has to sleep. He gets tired. He cries. He does these things humans do, but also he's fully divine. He ascends into glory. He takes on the sins of the world. He forgives sins. He does only the things that God can do. And so we have to hold these two natures of Christ in tension and say, okay, he's 100% human. He's also 100% divine. I'm not a mathematician. I don't know how that works out. 100% plus 100% equals 100% for Jesus. Um, so we don't get it. We don't fully understand it, but we take it on faith and we say, okay, God, this is what you have said within scripture. This is what we believe is true. Um, this is what we believe had to happen for our salvation. Again, it's confusing. We don't have a really good 100% answer on how to explain this. We'll dive into that in a few weeks as we explore Jesus and the two natures. So I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. The next phrase is our Lord. And this really speaks to the divinity of Jesus, that he is our Lord. He is fully God. Um, and so as fully God, his true and proper place is reigning and ruling over us. The first commandment speaks towards that as well. We should have no other gods before God Almighty. Jesus is that God as well as the second person of the Trinity. And so his rightful place in our lives is as number one. He's the one that directs us. He's the one that gives us guidance. He's the one we order our lives around. And his words and his laws and his teaching and his instruction has to be number one in our lives. And we do that as we keep him as that place as Lord of our lives. So we dive in then to Jesus' earthly life. The next phrase, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is important because he was conceived not in the normal way of man. Um, and so because he was not made in the normal way that you and I are made, um, Jesus was not made at all. I should clarify that right here. Jesus was not made. But as he took on flesh, it wasn't in the normal way that a man is made. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by an earthly father. And so because of that, because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, he's not guilty of original sin. And this means that Jesus is 100% sinless. And again, this is crucial for our understanding of Jesus' work on the cross. We'll get there in a few weeks, um, but I'm going to put it out there now that Jesus was 100% sinless. From the time he was conceived to the time he died into eternity, Jesus has never broken the law of God. He has always dwelt in perfect relationship with the Father. And that's important, that's crucial for us to say that Jesus took our place on a cross, Jesus took our sins upon him on the cross, so that we could have his righteousness, so that we could be 
in a right relationship with the Father. And so he, he um, changes his relationship with our relationship for just a little bit there on the cross as he pays the penalty for our sins. But saying he was conceived by the Holy Spirit is another way of saying he's not guilty of that original sin. And so he could be that sacrifice for us on the cross. The next phrase, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Um, this speaks towards the supernatural birth of Jesus and the provision of God. Again, towards um, Jesus is sinless. He's not guilty of that original sin, um, saying that if that is not part of his being, that is not part of his character. But also that God is involved in the salvation of mankind. God has a definite purpose and a definite plan for why he's sending Jesus, for how he's sending Jesus, as he picks this one woman, uh, from a very little known town, from a very little known family, and yet fulfilling all of the prophecies saying that from the very line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the nations of the world would be blessed through Mary, through her offspring, through Jesus. Again, we see that fulfillment, that all the nations of the world are blessed. Um, so he was born of the Virgin Mary. Now we skip a whole bunch of time in Jesus' life as we look at the Apostles' Creed. There's not anything spoken about Jesus life his works his actions the things that he did from the time that he was born until the time that he suffered within the Apostles Creed This is because the Apostles Creed uh, as a statement of our belief of what is important to us of central belief to us Is Jesus work on the cross? And so this is important for what it means to be Lutheran and that everything we do everything we preach teach confess all of our thinking all of our theology revolves around the cross revolves around what Jesus did on the cross as he gives his life as a sacrifice for our sins, as he welcomes us into that relationship with the Father. It's only through the cross, only through saving faith brought to us on the cross, that we can even begin to understand and relate to the teachings of Jesus and the things that he did in his life. So the Apostles' Creed and our belief is that the cross is first, the cross is central, and so we have to narrow in on the cross and get that right first before we can really look at the teachings of Jesus. And so we view the teachings of Jesus through his work on the cross. Hopefully that makes sense, um, but you may hear within Lutheran theology that we are theologians of the cross. That's a little bit of what we're speaking towards. So as we skip over uh, most of his life and his teachings, we get to his suffering. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. And this speaks a lot towards uh, first fulfillments of scripture, that the servants of God within Isaiah would suffer and would suffer on our behalf. Um, this is placed in there as well to say that Jesus suffered, but it also gives us a locator in time. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. And we can look back in history and we can look back in the records and say, okay, when was Pontius Pilate active and reigning and ruling in this area? And we can kind of locate where Jesus was within time, uh, very shortly after A.D., um, in the early 30s AD is kind of when we believe Jesus was living and, and doing the things that he was doing. Um, sorry, I lost my place in my notes here. So he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That gives us a grounding in history for when Jesus in act, is active. And that actually is confirmed by extra biblical sources as well. So there's a very famous uh, historian that lived shortly after Jesus. His, his name is Josephus, and he's kind of acclaimed as the historian of that time. He was living and active shortly after Jesus again, and he wrote about the things going on. And it's actually a very short reference to Jesus, um, but it is extra biblical proof that Jesus lived and did the things that he, uh, that scripture records him doing. And all that Josephus says basically is that there's a guy named Jesus. He's from Nazareth. He had a big following of people, and he was put to death under Pontius Pilate. So it's very short, but most people, um, scholarship and within the communities of historians and all that, they really don't debate, in part because of Josephus, that there was a man, that his name was Jesus, that he lived around this time, that he had a following, and that he was put to death on a cross. Uh, he suffered a criminal's death. So we see that just a little bit towards the um, historicity of Jesus. And no one really believes there wasn't a guy named Jesus. This is all kind of fiction. But you know, kind of history in general says, okay, Jesus lived and walked and had a following and was put to death 
what that means, that's up to theologians. But historians say, yes, he did actually live in the in the early ADs, um, probably 2 to about 35 AD is when we kind of guesstimate that Jesus was living and active. So we go on from there to say uh, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, he died, and he was buried. And so this is all kind of to say that he was crucified, meaning that he suffered a great deal. And I don't want to get into the details, um, but crucifixion was a brutal death. It was agony. If you want to talk about suffering, this was the way to do it. And the Romans were really good at making people suffer before they died. It's also to say that Jesus did actually die. Again, the Romans were really good at executions. They knew how to tell if a person was dead or if he wasn't dead, and that Jesus did actually die on the cross and that he was buried, that he was placed in a tomb, that tomb was sealed, there was a guard placed around the tomb, there was a stone rolled in front of the tomb. All of this to say that Jesus didn't fake his death. It wasn't like he was on the cross, he passed out, they put him in the tomb, and he woke up a couple hours later and snuck out of the tomb. No, he had a spear thrust to his side. He hung on the cross for hours. He had that blood loss. He had that true bodily death. To say that God died on the cross is a very real statement. The second person of the Trinity died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. And we believe in teaching, profess this in the Apostles' Creed, that he was crucified, he suffered for us, that he truly died, and that he was placed in the grave. Uh, most of the opposition, honestly, around the history of Jesus and around his work is about the death of Jesus. What does that actually mean? And so, again, we put this in there because the, the controversy and the people that push back against Christianity often will say uh, that Jesus didn't actually die, that he only looked like he died, that he faked his own death, that he passed out, that he woke up later, that the disciples came and revived him and took him away. Um, but we see that within Scripture it speaks of his death. We believe that he actually fully died again uh, and was placed into that tomb. The next phrase, he descended into hell. Um, and this is the phrase that uh, I guess we know the least about within the Apostles' Creed. We don't really know where this came from within the profession of the Apostles' Creed, within the profession of the early church. We do believe it's true. Um, so don't hear that and say it's not true. We do believe it's true that Jesus descended into hell. What exactly he was doing there, why he descended into hell, uh, we're not 100% sure on that. References are usually made to 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. Uh, let me pull that up here really quickly and read it to you. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. So that's one of the verses. We get it from another verse in Ephesians, I believe, um, that Jesus was actually descended into hell. What he did there, what he was doing there, again, not 100% sure. Most people kind of take this as um, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, the victory lap of Jesus. That as he took his sins upon, or as he took our sins upon himself on the cross, as he died, in his death he defeated sin and Satan and death and the devil. Because he was righteous, because he was that sacrifice for our sins, he is Lord over sin. He is Lord over death and the devil. And so as he descends into hell, that's kind of his victory lap of going to the home base of the enemy, going to the enemy camp, their fortified place, and saying and proclaiming to everyone and everything there, I've won, I am victorious through the cross, through God's work on the cross. Um, and so kind of proclaiming his victory over sin, death, and the devil as he descends into hell, goes into the very heart of the enemy's power, and then comes back out of that place fully alive, fully restored, fully well, um, invites us into that relationship, into that life as well. Um, so that's, I think that's all I'm going to say about the descent into hell. If you're interested in that, there's a lot more books, a lot more resources. We can get into that as well. Uh, again, shoot me an email. That interaction would be awesome. So he descended into hell, but the third day he rose again from the dead. And so right, right off the bat, as we get into the three days, um, you'll often hear people say, well, he wasn't actually dead for three days. He didn't spend three days in the tomb. Uh, this is a little bit lost in translation between ancient culture and our culture. So ancient culture would say any part of a day that you spent doing something, you could count it as the whole day. It would be uh, recorded as the whole day. 
So as we look at Jesus, he was in the grave uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's three days. But we also have to take into account that a day for them started at sundown. So Friday afternoon would have been Friday. Saturday all day to sundown would have been the second day. And then Saturday evening at sundown starts the third day, what we would consider Sunday. So you might hear people say, no, it was only two days because the women went to the tomb before the sun came up, as Scripture says. No, sundown was the beginning of the third day. So that's where we get the three days. The total amount of time Jesus actually spent in the tomb, probably about 30 hours, give or take, is our best guess. Um, but that's how we get the three days. That's where we get the three days within Scripture, within their culture. Uh, again, it takes a little bit of translation to get into our culture, into our time frame. Um, but that's how you can explain it if anyone says, no, he wasn't dead for three days. Well, yeah, he was, um, depending on how you translate that culture into our culture. Is the time frame important? Is it important that it was three full days, that it was 72 hours? No, not at all. Uh, God can accomplish his work in any time frame that he wants. The three days was to fulfill scripture. Again, written in the culture, in the time, um, where days were part of the day, was counted as the full day, and day began at sundown. So we see that scripture fulfilled within Jesus' life. Um, and it's a little short excursus, um, but it, it brings to light a little bit of a fact, too, that when we read scripture, we do have to remember that scripture is written in a specific time, in a specific culture, in a specific context. So we do have to pay attention to some of those things and at least be conversant with the facts around it, be able to explain those things, as I've just done to you, as you walk through them, as you talk about them with other people that are Christian that maybe aren't uh, Christian, however that looks. So he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. So raising from the dead is, again, crucial to our understanding of Christianity, to our understanding of what Jesus has done for us. I spoke about this last year on Good Friday. I'm going to speak about it again here because it's important for us um, that most people kind of view Good Friday and Easter Sunday as separate events. And I would uh, motion, I would argue that we have to see Good Friday and Easter as one event. This is the salvation event that Jesus works from the cross to hell to the empty grave, his life, his death, and his resurrection for us. And we have to see it as one event. And so Easter and the empty grave and the resurrection are just as important, just as crucial for us as the cross is. As we would say, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, if he's not physically alive, as Paul says within Scripture, then we're most to be pitied above all men because our faith is in vain. We're still dead in our sins. But if Christ has been raised from the dead and he's given us this promise of new life, we can have faith in that promise. We can have faith in the promise of Jesus of being welcomed into that new life as well. So a lot of the controversy and pushback against Christians is to say that uh, Jesus was not raised to new life. Jesus is not resurrected. And it's important here to notice that people don't say, no, the tomb wasn't empty. There's really no one that says the tomb wasn't empty. That's pretty well attested um, from Scripture and from extra-biblical sources. All of the controversy kind of points to why was the tomb empty? The theories are the disciples came and they took Jesus away um, before people kind of knew what was happening, before people knew to look. Some would say that the women that went to the tomb that morning actually took Jesus' body and they went and hid the body. And all this doesn't really make sense as we think of the guards that were posted around the tomb. Now, they were posted on their lives. If they failed in their duty, they would have been put to death by the Roman government. And so for them to say they allowed a few women to come and take the body of Jesus from the grave uh, is pretty ludicrous. No one really believes that the guards would let him do that. There's also all the extra measures that were placed on the tomb. There's the seal of the government, that if that seal were broken, they would know the tomb was messed with. There's the stone that was rolled over the front of the tomb. Uh, again, there's the guards that would have been put to death because of failing in that duty. Um, but in the midst of all of that, no one really says the tomb wasn't empty. They just think the body of Jesus was taken away. How you deal with that, how you want to speak towards that, um, we would say and believe, again, that Jesus was raised from the dead, that there's no body because he is alive. There's no body to be found there. Again, there are some that think the body of Jesus was taken away. It was buried elsewhere. I've seen things on the History Channel and whatnot that say they found the, the body of Jesus. None of that we believe is true. We believe Jesus was raised to new life. There is no body to be found because Jesus is in heaven. 
And as we get into the next point, we see that um, that Jesus was raised from the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So from earth he ascends into heaven. As he does that, he assumes his rightful place as reigning and ruling over creation. As the second person of the Trinity, as God, that is his place. He is to reign and rule over creation. Um, but we also see another portion of that uh, within the next phrase, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. As he reigns and as he rules, his proper role then is also as judge, as judge of creatures, as judge of you and I. Um, the beauty of the cross, the beauty of this whole story, the beauty of the work of Jesus and everything we're going to talk about moving forward is that judgment has already been rendered on the cross. That as sins are judged, they are judged in Jesus, not judged in you and I. That he takes the penalty of sin upon himself gives us his righteousness. So that on the cross, and because of the cross, the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus, you and I are declared righteous. We're declared sinless in the presence of God as we get to eternity and as we get to heaven. So we look forward towards that judgment that is coming. Uh, the gospel speak of the, the coming judgment, but we don't look for it in fear and in trembling and in not knowing what happens in that judgment. No, we look towards it and say, Jesus has said I'm righteous. Jesus has said I'm sinless. Jesus has said I'm forgiven. I know that because of him, because of his work on the cross, because of the righteousness he's given me through the cross, through baptism, through faith, that I will be in heaven, that I will have everlasting life with God. Um, but scripture does speak towards a judgment that is coming. Jesus is going to return. He is going to render judgment. That judgment is going to be based on faith. Do you have faith in Jesus? Do you profess him as Lord? Or do you not have faith in Jesus and is something else Lord of your life? And those who profess Jesus as Lord, who believe in their hearts, God has raised him from the dead, believe in their hearts the promises of scripture, they will be with God in heaven for eternity, enjoying that renewed relationship, that righteousness of dwelling with God. For those that don't believe, for those that do not have faith in their hearts, that uh, don't believe that Jesus is Lord and have other lords in their lives, they'll be cast out of the presence of God. They don't have that righteousness, and so the reality of that is they cannot be in the presence of God. That's what scripture speaks towards um, in judgment and in the end times. If you want to hear more about that, uh, Vicar Josh right now is doing a great study on Revelation. We're getting towards the end of that, but I do invite you to go over. Um, you can find it within the YouTube links here in the different pages on St. Paul. But he's walking through every chapter of Revelation that deals with some of these events, deals with some of these topics. And you can walk with him, um, shoot him emails, shoot me email, emails, questions, whatever that might be towards that. So that is a really, really, really quick view of the Apostles' Creed. And I'm trying to keep these videos a little bit shorter, a little bit easier to digest in one go. Um, so we're going to stop there for today. Next week, we're going to really look and dive into the work of Jesus. The next article of the Augsburg Confession is justification, which means how are you and I pronounced just? How are we pronounced right? How are we pronounced sinless before God? in the face of original sin, in the face of the sins that we commit every day. And the answer to that is Jesus Christ. The answer to that is the cross and the work that he's accomplished for us on the cross and in the empty grave. But we'll get there. Stay tuned for next week. We're going to dive in a lot deeper. Uh, until then, I hope you all are healthy. I hope you all are well. You're in my prayers. Everyone watching this is in my prayers. I hope this word is going out. Please feel free to share this video with anyone that you think might benefit from it. Feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube underneath. Um, I'd love to interact and engage in that way. You can also shoot me an email, pastorandrew at stpaulboca.com, stpaulboca.com. I would love to interact in the emails and answer any questions or further discussion that you might have there as well. Until next week, stay safe, and remember, Jesus loves you.